songs that we know.
and I hear far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of loss sinners were slain so I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay And I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. Oh, that old rugged cross so despised by the world it has a wondrous attraction for me for the dear lamb of god left his glory above to bear it to Trophies at last I'll lay down, and I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a To the old rugged cross, I will ever be true. Its shame and reproach gladly bear. And then he'll call me someday.
and so free. Tell him you love him this morning. Sing, oh. Lord, we love you, Jesus. Lord, we thank you uh, for who you are in our lives. We thank you for saving us. We thank you for redeeming us, Lord Jesus. We thank you for being near to us, uh, Lord. And we thank you for surrounding us with your love, Lord Jesus. And Father, our prayer here this morning is that uh, you would be lifted up and glorified. No other man, no other person, Lord, but you alone, Christ Jesus, in whom is our salvation, in whom our peace is, and in whom our triumph is, Lord Jesus. We pray that, uh, that you would absolutely empower us to walk out of the lies that we have believed, Lord, and that we embrace your truth, Lord, and that we apply it in our lives and in our minds, Lord Jesus. We we repent this morning, Lord, for lifting up ourselves, Lord, in place of you. We lay that down, Lord. We repent of every idolatry, Lord. We repent of every disobedience, Lord. We repent uh, for ever thinking this was about ourselves. And Lord Jesus, we put our eyes on you. And Lord, may you move. May you be highly exalted in this place. May the name of Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone be honored and glorified in our midst, Lord Jesus. Thank you for setting us free. Thank you for breaking the chains of addiction, breaking the chains of depression, the, the chains of despondency, Lord, and leading us in to new life, into new grace, into new mercy each morning. And so, Father, I pray that you anoint me to preach the Word of God this morning. Anoint me to preach what only you would have me to say, nothing more and nothing less. Lord, open our ears, open the understanding of our hearts this morning to receive truth and let those seeds be planted well in our lives. Pray these things in your name, Jesus. Amen and amen. Uh, if you have your Bibles, open them to John chapter 8. John chapter 8, we'll be going to verses 31 through 47 this morning. Uh, this is uh, continuing our series on spiritual warfare. And this, the title of this morning's message is The Spirit of Deception. 
the spirit of deception or the lies that we believe, and we are now beginning to see a framework for spiritual warfare. John chapter 8, beginning in verse 31. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. I speak of what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have heard from your father. They answered him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would, not be doing, or you would be doing the works Abraham did. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. You are doing the works your father did. They said to him, we were not born of sexual immorality. We have one father, even God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me, for I've come from God and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? Whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. Spiritual warfare can be distilled down into three enemies, right? It's going to be uh, the world, the flesh, and the devil. We talked about those in the first sermon on this series, but now we're going to go in a little bit deeper and explore each of those three enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil. This morning will be the devil, next week will be the devil, but then we have a framework for how we walk in freedom, how we walk in truth. We bring the lies of the enemy to the judgment seat of God, right? The white throne judgment and uh, judgments pronounced on those lies and then we receive the truth and the truth is what sets us free. So spiritual warfare is not about Harry Potter and playing Dungeons and Dragons. Those, and they may be some, some maliciousness to them, those, those are distractions, right? And for far too long, us Christians have focused on the externals, right? We focused on a, those things which really are minuscule compared to the way Satan operates in this world because we have forgotten that the devil appears as an angel of light. And those things are way too easy, right? They're, they're way out, they're, they're easy to spot, but primarily the enemy works within us and among us as an angel of light. And so we're going to talk about the devil's origins, right? The cosmic rebellion. He's not, he doesn't wear a red cape and carry around a pitchfork, right? We're going to look at the origins, talk about the cosmic rebellion, the sons of God, and we'll get to that over the next several weeks. But when you mention spiritual warfare, a lot of modern day people will probably laugh at you. They'll probably laugh and say, well, that it really is antiquated or it's old-fashioned or you're taking a, a militant view. And, and, but in actuality, in reality, none of the theories of this world explain what we experience. 
We experience some dark times. We experience some uh, miraculous times. And, and Jesus tells us that there is an invisible yet real presence in the world that is our enemy, right? That is uh, the devil. And the primary strategy of the devil is not to get us to watch uh, the Smurfs, right? It's, it's not to get us to uh, absolutely just like maybe not watch Harry Potter. The primary strategy of the enemy is to get us to believe his lies. It's to get us to believe his lies over us, believe the lies over God's people, believe the lies over others, right? And so that's what spiritual warfare first and foremost is, believing the truth of God and resisting the lies of the enemy. So this morning, the devil, talking about the spirit of deception. For Jesus, the devil is real. For Jesus, the devil is a murderer. And for Jesus, the way that the devil does this is through lies. He's real, he's a murderer, and he's the father of all lies. And so spiritual warfare comes down to that. Look back at verse 44. You are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. The signature move, M-O, of the devil is to move in deception, to deceive people, right? And so what we've got to do, we've got to explore what is truth. We've got to know the truth so that we can spot the lie when it comes towards us or to us, right? And so what is truth? When you look at this, there's a lot of philosophical camps, right, about what truth is. Those that believe there's an objective truth or an objective reality. Those who say that perception is reality, that interpretation is reality, right? And to a degree that is true, but when you go up against certain like natural laws like gravity, for example... You may think that you can fly, but if you jump off a 10-story building without a parachute, you're going to hit the ground. If you jump out of, a, out of an airplane, you can believe that you can fly, but, but honestly, if you have no parachute, you're going to hit the ground. Gravity is reality, the reality that we encounter, right? So we're exploring what is truth. And so uh, basically Jesus is truth and lies are unreality. Lies are unreality. Here's how this works, guys. Pay attention. We all have these mental maps, right? We've got these mental maps of reality. We've got mental maps for like how we get to work. And if our mental maps are wrong, then we're going to be late to work or not show up at all. In my mental map, I know I'll go down here to Campbellsville, take a right, and then a left onto the university. It gets me to my office, right? But if my mental map is wrong, if my mental map says that, no, you go to Columbia, then to Somerset, I'm going to be late to work and then eventually be fired. It all begins with our mental maps. And the same holds true not only for where we work, right, but, but for our lives of faith. What we believe, right, and then we actualize and step into it. And there's uh, 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 the worldview of how we view the world. We've got these assumptions that we make about reality, right? And we need to get down and distill it down into the truth of Jesus Christ. We've got these assumptions, these mental maps about reality, right? And we hold ideas about the future. Here's where it starts to pick up traction. We... We hold ideas about the future because God has given us imagination, right? He hasn't given cats an imagination or dogs an imagination, but he's given humans an imagination so we can imagine what tomorrow is going to look like. We can imagine the conversation that we're going to have later this evening, and then we start moving towards that and living that out. That's a mental map, right? We imagine what is going to happen. And so we can imagine like, like I imagine like a smoothie bowl is going to be great for lunch today, right? And then I move towards that, right? And, and then I, I, I'm real nice and kind to, to Amanda and she would make the smoothie bowl. I receive the, the smoothie bowl, right? Or like for, for all of us, I would like a pumpkin spice latte. We don't have it now. I don't think we have it. 
We want a pumpkin spice latte, and then we go through, we actualize it or make it real with our bodies. We go to, the, to Starbucks, we order a pumpkin spice latte, and then what do we get? A pumpkin spice latte. See how that works? We got these ideas and these assumptions, right? These dreams and realities of what we uh, believe is reality, and then we move with our bodies towards making that imagination, that desire, a current reality. Do you see how this is happening here? These imaginations talking about spiritual warfare. However, we can believe things which are not true. And then with our bodies, we can pursue them and make the untrue thing a reality. That's at the heart of spiritual warfare. That's at the heart of spiritual warfare. And, and so to put it simply, to believe lies. But uh, we say that over and over and over and over again. Maybe we need to uh, flesh that out a little bit. When we believe lies about ourselves, about God, about others, and then when we believe that, we begin to live accordingly to that. And then after a while, we begin to experience that reality. Our ideas about God, about sexuality, about spirituality, about humanity, and so guys, we, we live at the mercy of our ideas. How we think is how we become, right? Talking about spiritual warfare, and when we believe the truth, we live well. But when we believe lies, we end up in disorder, chaos, brokenness, and a living hell here on earth. We self-destruct. Talking about spiritual warfare, talking about the spirit of, of deception. We have paranoia and we, we have uh, uh, all of these, uh, uh, these things which are taunting us and, and terrorizing us. For example, we, we say to ourselves, I'm, I'm so disgusting, I'm so unlovable, I'm so dirty, right? I am so, uh, God could never ever uh, forgive me and, and my family would be much better off if I were dead. These are lies from hell. But we think they're true. They're not true. They're lies that we believe and then we live our lives accordingly. This is at the heart of spiritual warfare. And now our enemy, the devil, the serpent, the Nakesh, right? The spirit of deception. Let's look at that. In Genesis 3, we see the serpent appear to Eve. And, and what does he do? The first thing, what he leads with is a lie. He says in, in Genesis chapter 3, uh, verse 1, he said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? He never said that. God never said that. He said you can eat of any tree except for the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So the serpent comes with a lie. The first time we see him encounter humanity, it is with a lie. He twists the truth of God. And that's how he operates in our lives. We can be following Jesus for decades upon decades, but he'll still come to us with a lie. And we have to be so ingrained with the truth, abiding in Jesus, because if not, we won't recognize the lie. And we'll think it's truth and we'll live it out. And so when people believe these lies and act on them with their bodies, those things become true. Here's some illustrations. God can't forgive me for what I did. And you may hear, they'll, they'll throw out the unpardonable sin is, is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, which I'll just say that's rejecting Jesus Christ continually, continually, habitually, over and over and over again. But a lot of people believe, well, if you know, like I know that God forgives, but like there's this one thing that I did that honestly God will never forgive me for. And as a result, we believe those lies and then we live those out. We don't go to church. We don't pray. We don't think that God loves us. We think that our lives are chaotic and meaningless and we end up bringing hell to earth instead of heaven to earth. Another example of a lie is the lie that you are unlovable. 
We tell ourselves these lies that, that I'm unlovable or that I'm ugly or that I'm disgusting, right? And we believe this lie. And look, the way this lie has taken place, the enemy, the serpent has come up uh, behind us in our, in our ear and has whispered, you're unloving, you're disgusting. And so we walk around with our heads down. We walk around thinking that we are the worst of the outcast, the least of the least. And so we, when we see somebody, right, we don't think anybody can love us, let alone God. But when we, when we find somebody, we don't think that they truly, that we are earning or, or warranted of their love. And so we seek and gravitate toward abusive relationships. To reinforce the ideas that we're dirty, we're disgusting, we're wrong, and that we're bad. We think that's what we deserve. And maybe this is landing with one or two folk here this morning. But this is how the spirit of deception works. Comes and says you're unloving. And then leads you out into the world to look for those who are going to victimize you. Because you think that's what you deserve. You look for those who are going to talk mean to you. Because you think that's what you deserve. You look for those who are just going to use you for your your body because you think that's all you're good for. Talking about spiritual warfare, talking about the spirit of deception that has enslaved so many people. That they've carried out the thing which is a lie and they've made it a present reality. And here's another one. Church folk will hurt you worse than anybody. You say, I, I don't go to church because that's, that's where I was hurt at last time. And, and I just want to share, absolutely, you're right. That can be some of the worst hurt that we ever experience, right? And those things that we've experienced, I'm sure maybe if we were to go back in time, those Christ followers would ask for forgiveness. But here we are, right? And so we gather together around the throne of grace and receive forgiveness and forgive those who have forgiven us. But if we continue to believe the lie that we'll always get hurt in church, then we stop coming to church. And then we live lives of isolation. We're an open target and the enemy begins to twist our minds and cause our hearts to grow calloused and and lukewarm and, and so as a response we should be moving towards and we're going to address each of these lies in just a minute but we should be moving towards love and reconciliation right always loving Jesus Christ and no matter what church you land in there's always going to be some things that are not perfect right you just live a life of grace live a life of mercy right God will protect you he'll be with you and don't live out that lie right that only hurt happens in church because healings happen in church also. Restorations happen in church also. Salvations and sanctification happens in church as well. Here's another lie. You'll never amount to anything. You'll never amount to anything. And so as a result, we're so afraid of failure that we never leave our, our bedroom or, or our basements, right? And we think that we absolutely do not deserve good things. Or, or here's another lie. She stopped loving you years ago. And so we've developed this spirit of suspicion with our spouse, right? And we just look for instances to back up the lies that we believe that they don't love us anymore. And here's another lie. You're dirty and you're unwanted. You're dirty and you're unwanted. We know your past. We know your family's past. You come from a bad part of town. You come from the wrong side of the tracks. Your family has been this and that for generations and generations. You're going to be nothing but that. That's a lie from hell. That's the spirit of deception at operation in your life. And so we need to be broke free from that, right? Broke free. And, and if not, if we believe that we're dirty, believe that nobody wants us, that nobody loves us, we end up living in a prison in our mind. Until Jesus comes and sets the captive free. That's why we need Jesus until the love of Jesus sets us free. And so the devil's, look, we're not done. He's given these lies, right? But he doesn't just randomly give us lies. He'll send out lies which match our disordered desires. 
our disordered desires, right? He will send a lie that latches on to that. And then those desires that we have, we're going to get into this in just a minute. He'll lie to us, and then our desires will latch on to that. And then those desires are reinforced by secular society. That's the world. The lies, or the lies that the enemy says, the disordered desires of our own hearts is the flesh, and normalized secular society is the world. So we begin to see such a heavy picture here of how the enemy operates, right? He plays, and when you're saved, when you're following Jesus, positionally you are without sin. You are saved by faith through grace, right? But until we get to heaven, we're living lives of sanctification. This flesh, right, will still battle us, right? We'll still go through things. We'll have desires which are not yet fully healthy. They're disordered desires that we have, the desire to be seen, the desire to be known, the desire to feel good at every turn, at every corner, these desires, the devil will latch on to those. And so let's talk about it just a minute, these disordered desires. Now we're talking about the flesh, what scripture calls these bodies, right, these, these mortal bodies which bind us to to doing things that we wouldn't normally want to do. And so the problem is not just that we, we uh, do evil, but it's that we want to do evil. This is textbook Christianity 101. This is theology 101. And so we've got these disordered desires that are designed to give us complete happiness, right? The, the escapism that we love to dwell in, right? When life gets difficult, we want to escape the room. Although we can't physically, we can pop a few pills and by effect we are escaping. We think that we're happy, right? And the devil will play on that again and again and again until we're taken down into a hole of captivity with no way out. Talking about spiritual warfare. Talking about the disordered desires that then become reinforced by society that says, hey, it's, you, you want to choose your own gender, that's completely fine. Society will rubber stamp it and say you can do what you want to do. Thinking that they're given a license to freedom, a license to happiness, but in reality it's taking them down a pit of confusion and self-destruction. Talking about the spirit of deception which comes toward us. And then it reinforces those lies through society, the world. Talking about spiritual warfare. World War II. Germany was the thought leader in the world at that time. They led the world in terms of literature, in terms of art. Uh, they were the thought leaders of civilization, of civilized society, yet a lie gets so implanted within that system that it leads to six million people being murdered. You see, the lies from the enemy, which map on to our disordered desires, when it's reinforced by society, awful things happen. Talking about chaotic, destructive, murderous things. The, the devil is a murderer, right? And we can go through other illustrations where he's warped the minds of society to, uh, to think that, uh, that, that, that killing unborn babies is no problem at all. He's warped our minds to thinking that like we can choose and determine our own gender, right? He's warped the minds of the masses to say that there is no God, that there is no order, that there is is no structure and the spirit of deception didn't start just yesterday didn't it's not going to start at the beginning of uh, the tribulation which has already began the spirit of deception started working in the garden of eden and so as christ followers if we're following jesus christ this is what we've got to be focused on following his truth as a guide for our lives to illuminate our hearts, right? And, and we begin to, to, to walk out the truth. And so the question is, then, what do you believe is true? This morning, what do you believe 
is true. And over the next several weeks, this will probably take us well into next year, talking about spiritual warfare. This is kind of laying the road map. We've talked about the spirit of accusation, the spirit of rejection, the spirit of captivity, the spirit of discouragement, right? We see the, how the devil operates in our lives. And so now through the word of God, we see the strategies of darkness that have been assigned to us to play upon those desires that we have to look the best, to be the best, right? And to bring us out of truth and plant us in the world. And then the world says, yeah, you're doing it right. You only live once, right? And then we fall into a pit of despair. So the question is, church, what do you believe this morning? It's easy to spot the lies that others believe. <laughs> It's easy to spot the lies that other people believe. And we can sit on the sidelines and say, man, the spirit of deception is heavy on that one. Don't they see that it's really not about numbers? It's not about anything else. It's always about the life of the spirit. Or, man, that person's so deceived that they're going head first into a lifestyle of addiction. I can see that. I can spot that. But what we cannot see is the giant spirit of deception over our own lives that's leading us to backstabbing and backbiting and gossiping and missing church, right, and moving towards others, not in love, but in judgment and hate. I can spot your lie. I can spot your spirit of deception, but I can't see mine, even though he's 11 foot tall standing right behind me. We've got to believe truth, guys. We've got to trust. To believe is not to just Make a mental note, say, yes, Jesus said that, but... No, yes, Jesus said that. No, to believe, to believe is to lay hope, to trust with everything you have. I mean, we, and I've said this three times, I'm not a gambler, but all chips toward the middle of the table, right? Uh, all, all in, all in, Jesus, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to give you my life. I'm going to believe what you say is true. I'm not going to listen to the devil. I'm not going to listen to the secular world. Tell me my value. Tell me who I am. Tell me about my purpose. I'm only going to trust you, Jesus. Leaning in to the voice of truth. Jesus came as a rabbi, as a teacher. I think this is so important, and when I began to study this, I really didn't realize it before. We know the Messiah is uh, the triumphant king, right? But when Jesus comes in uh, to journey alongside the experience of flesh and humanity with us, he appears as a teacher. A teacher. Now, he could have appeared as a, 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 a general in an army, right, that immediately took, uh, took out, out of Jerusalem and, and started chopping some heads off of some pagans and some Gentiles and some foreign kings and absolutely annihilating uh, everything that was not or did not belong to him. But Jesus did not do that. He came to us as a teacher, right, as a teacher king philosopher king. He came, right, as Messiah. He completely redefines the war that people were expecting. They were expecting a, a liberator to come that would physically remove Rome, that would physically uh, annihilate the handcuffs that were on God's people. But he comes as a sacrificial lamb, laying down his life for those that were in sin. Laying down his life for those that were blind. The real enemy is not Rome or the United Nations or Republicans or Democrats. The real enemy is the world, the flesh, and the devil. And Jesus wipes them all out. He wipes them all out, guys. I mean, he absolutely annihilates them and takes the keys. We learned last week the keys is authority. So he's destroyed, right, sin, death, hell, and the grave. And as Christ followers, as uh, Christ apprentices, right, we're following him. And those enemies have been defeated. But yet in our own lives, we still struggle. We see these things which are difficult to understand. We pray for years and years. 
and years, yet we still experience some difficult things. But Jesus waylays them to the side. He didn't bring a machine gun. He brought the truth. He brought truth. And his tactic is sacrificial death. He laid down his life. And by his truth, we are set free. Our fight against the devil is the fight to believe truth over lies and to internalize the truth that Jesus has spoken to us. And when we believe lies, when we believe lies, guys, that, that our worth and our significance is uh, confined to our appearance, or when we believe lies that our worth and significance is confined to our accomplishments, when we believe the lies that, that nobody loves us, when we believe the lies that everything is our fault, when we believe the lies that granddaddy was an alcoholic, so I'm going to be an alcoholic, when we believe the lies that she stopped loving me years ago, when we believe the lies that, that God cannot forgive me, though there's power which is unleashed by believing those lies. Power. But there's a greater power. There's a greater power that when we receive the voice of truth that says, I'm always with you, I never leave you, never abandon you. When we receive the voice of truth that says, I've got your name written on the palm of my hand. When we receive the voice of truth that says, you are the apple of my eye. When, when we receive the voice of truth that says, I'm going to, you get up, you've fallen seven times, get back up. I'm going to keep forgiving you no matter what you did, right? When we believe the voice of truth that says, we're in this together, I'm right there with you. When we believe the voice of truth, a greater power is unleashed in our life. It's talking about spiritual warfare. Not Dungeons and Dragons and Harry Potter. And I, I don't know, I'm sure those things may have some bad context. And I'm, this is not an endorsement. Don't go say that I'm endorsing Harry Potter. We're not going to make DVDs. I'm, what I'm saying is that there's something more real, guys, that we've missed for years. And it's risen up in our churches. And it's rising up in our own lives. We believe that somebody said something about us last week, last month, last year, so we won't sit next to them. The reality is they never said a thing about us, but the lies we believe have caused division in some of our lives. This is an example, nothing specific. I'm just throwing it out there. We have to believe the voice of truth, the words of truth. And so what will you believe this morning? This is not, this is, this is to be contextualized and let it lay where it lays within your heart, within your spirit. And do you really, really believe, guys? I mean, do you believe that when you pray in the morning, and you get down on your knees or you, or you go to your table to read scripture, do you really believe that Jesus is right there with you? Because if you don't, you're believing a lie. Because he says he's right there. He never leaves us. He never abandons us. He never forsakes us. Let this radicalize your prayer life. So when you go to your prayer closet, beside your bed, imagine Jesus right there. Right? I mean embracing you. You can talk to him. There is no barrier. He broke that barrier 2,000 years ago. Right? Will we believe that when we pray, Jesus is right there? Also... When we're about to sin, will we believe Jesus is right there? When we're on the cusp of committing sexual immorality, when we're on the cusp of turning our backs on God, when we're on the cusp of absolutely lashing out in anger at our spouse, will we believe that the Holy Spirit is right there within us? And that if we carry out that sin, we take him with us. The words that we speak, he's right there with us. The actions we do, he's right there with us. Will we believe truth this morning? That Jesus turns nobody away. That he, in fact, he will never turn anybody 
away? Or, or, or will we believe that when we can't even muster a word, we've been uh, so weary and bogged down, do we believe that, that when we can't even pray, that, that, that He's right there praying for us on our behalf with utterings, uh, with groanings which cannot even be uttered, right? That He is right there when we feel unloved, when we believe that He is right there with us, right? Knows everything about us and died for us, even at our worst times. Will we believe, like when we're ready to give up, that truth is right there with us and that He's hovering over us like a fortress, like a shield? Will we believe the truth of Jesus Christ? So we don't have to be deceived any longer. As Amanda comes up to the piano, what I want to do here for the next couple minutes, two minutes, is I want us to encourage us to spot the lies that we've been believing. I've named a few up here, and, 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 and we need to, to examine the lies that we've been believing in our lives. So what I would like for the few of us to do, if you could please, to bow your head and close your eyes. Begin to pray silently. Remember, Jesus is right here with us. And I'm going to give you a space right here to to silently pray and, and ask the Holy Spirit to show you the lies that you've believed. Allow those lies by the power of the Holy Spirit to come to the surface right now. And if you want to take out a pen and a piece of paper, take it out and, and write it down and write down the lies that you've been believing, right? And it might be the lies that, that you're not good enough or the lie that God cannot forgive you, whatever it may be. We're going to take the next 60 seconds or so in quietness and in prayer and allow those lies to surface. Do it now. In Jesus' name, empowered by His Spirit, think about it. Pray about it. Then with your head still bowed and eyes closed, uh, as you continue, this is not the stopping point for that, this continues. And then after we pray here in just a minute, when you go home today and throughout the week, I encourage you to take out a piece of paper and, and write down the lies that the enemy's been telling you. And then, and then spot a disordered desire within your own life. You're like, yeah, I can see that now. That's why the enemy has been telling me this. Because I'm positioned this way. Right? And spot and write down the lie or the desire that that lie maps onto, is associated with, connects to, right? For example, it could be a lie that you have no worth and the disordered desire is that you hate your life. And then spot out where that's normalized through society, through secular society. When society says that there is no God, that you come from an animal. Write it out, recognize it, see it, and then repent of it. That's what repentance is. It means literally, metanoia means changing of the mind. Changing of the mind, and that's what we're going to move toward right now. We need to repent, and I, 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 repentance can include weeping and wailing and, and just tearing and ashes and all of that, but primarily it begins in the mind to where we stop subscribing to the lies of the enemy and we start embracing and believing the voice of truth. And I believe that God wants to do a deep work in your life and a deep work in our church, right? And we've got to live by the Spirit and not by flesh. And so for the next few moments, as Amanda begins to sing and play, ask the Holy Spirit to search you out for those lies. When you recognize them, repent of them. Say, Lord, I'm tired of believing the lie that I'll always get, get away with this thing or that thing, Lord. And I come to you in openness and truth and honesty. 
And then when you get home, look for Scripture which counters those lies. Sit with the Word of God. Believe the Word of God. Search them out. When the enemy tells you that you cannot be forgiven, search out Scriptures on forgiveness. When the enemy tells you that you're not loved, look up verses for God's love for you. Guys, this is spiritual warfare. It's not easy. But this is what it's about. And so, with your heads continued to be bowed and eyes closed, we all pray, Lord Jesus, we love you. We thank you, Lord. And our prayer this morning is that you would help us to recognize and spot those lies within our lives, Lord, and allow us to move towards you in truth. Allow your truth and your spirit to awaken us, Lord, and uh, to strengthen us and to encourage us, Lord Jesus, so that we live lives of complete freedom in you, Jesus. Allow God, even though we sometimes lack tactical warfare experience, sometimes, God, it seems like our strength is completely drained. We can't even get up enough energy to wake up in the morning and pray, Holy Spirit, our prayer this morning is that you would fall upon us. Give us your strength. Give us your power. Give us your strength. Give us deliverance through the blood of Jesus Christ this morning. And so, Lord Jesus, we love you. Do a mighty work in our lives, Lord. We don't want, just like you, Lord, for nobody, for nobody to be lost, for nobody to be caught in suffering and struggling, Lord. But lead us all to the place of complete and divine freedom. Lord, we love you. Move in our lives, we pray. Amen and amen.